Part of the chapter that I want to focus on is beginning there in verse number 7 where the Bible reads, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And what I want to preach about this morning is the subject of prayer. And I want to talk about six different types of prayer that are found in the Bible. But first I just want to point out to you the meaning of the word prayer. If we just look at the word pray itself, it means to ask for something. When we're praying, that's what we're doing. And often in the Bible, you'll read people just saying one to another things like, I pray thee, where they're just asking another person for something. So that's all it means to pray. Here he says in verse 7, ask and ye shall receive. He said, ask and it shall be given you. And seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. But notice what he says in verse 11. He says, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And the implication is there that if you don't ask, you're not going to get the good things. And if you do ask, then you shall receive. Go to James chapter 4 and he explicitly tells us in James chapter 4 that we have not because we ask not. So if we're not praying, then we're missing out on receiving good things and good gifts from God. It's not that we're going to receive the same things no matter what we do and no matter what happens. No, there are good gifts that God has in store for his children that he will only give to those who ask him. And if you do not pray, then you're missing out on the blessings of God. It says in James chapter 4, verse 2, Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because... You ask not. It's that simple. And I've heard people even say things like, you know, well, you know, God's already going to give you everything. You know, you just pray just to, just to show God your faith or something. No, I pray because I believe that praying is going to change things. Amen. And I pray because I believe that praying is going to allow me to receive things that I would not otherwise receive had I not Pray. For me, praying is not just an exercise or a ritual that I would go through, but rather prayer is a direct access to God to get something that I need or to get something that I want. Now, when God says that everyone that asketh receiveth, and when the Bible says things like, you know, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, you have to understand that there's often a bit of a caveat with that. Because, for example, he says, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Right. Or he'll say, we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Here in James, he says that you have not because you ask not. But then in verse three, he says, ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So what he's saying there is, if you pray and you do not receive, basically what is he saying? You're doing it wrong. Because he's saying, you know, if you're continually praying and not getting your prayers answered, you might just be praying for things to consume upon your lust. God is not giving us a promise that says, hey, if you pray for whatever bonuses and, and money and cars and houses, you know, I'll just give you all that wealth and riches. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't pray for things that you would consume upon your lust. We're to pray for spiritual things. Now, look, if you would, at Matthew chapter number six, Matthew chapter number six. By the way, I've always thought it was neat in that verse in Matthew seven, where it says, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. If you take the first letter of each of those words, it spells the word ask. So it actually makes that verse really easy to memorize. It says, ask, that's the A, and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be, so it actually spells ask right in that verse. So God's saying that he wants to give us good things, just like we want to give good gifts to our children. And if they ask us for bread, we're not going to give them a stone. If they ask us for a fish, we're not going to give them a serpent. If they ask us for an egg, we're not going to give them a scorpion. Okay, he's saying if we, being evil, 
in comparison to God, because God is so much greater and more holy than we are. If we being evil know how to get good gifts unto our children, how much more will the Father which is in heaven give good things to those that ask him, give good gifts unto his children? It says in Matthew 6, verse 7, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray you. And then he's going to give an example of how to pray. And the reason I'm turning here is to show you some examples of what we should be asking for. Because Jesus says, pray in this way, pray after this manner. So this will give us some ideas of what we should pray for. What's funny is that people will often chant this prayer and use it as a vain repetition. The Catholics will call this, you know, doing a series of Our Fathers. They'll do a series of Hail Marys and a series of Our Fathers. And it's funny because he just finished saying, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. They think that they should be here for their much speaking. He's saying, pray after this manner. And then they just chant that. When he just finished telling them, don't chant, don't repeat things vainly. God already knows the things that we have need of before we ask him. Does that mean that we're going to get those things without asking? No, because the Bible says, if we ask not, we will have not. But what it is saying is that we don't need to chant over and over again what we need. We could just tell God one time what we need and we don't have to just over and over chant it vainly. Now, we can plead with God about something multiple times if it's from the heart every time. But not just, well, you know, if I say this 50 times, he's going to answer me. Or if I do it every day, it's going to get answered. Not necessarily. Now, the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 6, 9, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So, of course, first of all, we see that honor and reverence is being given to God and an understanding is there that it's God's will that needs to happen. Not what we will, but as he will. And so he says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So in this scripture, we can get some ideas of what we should be praying for. Now, first of all, notice there's nothing wrong with praying for our physical needs. In verse 11, he says, give us this day our daily bread. That's talking about physical food that we need to live. So there's nothing wrong with praying that we will have the food that we need or praying that we would have the lodging that we need or, or the vehicle that we need. Things that we need to live and to serve him, to have clothing and food and things like that. But what the Bible is telling us not to do is pray for things to just consume upon our lusts. Now go to Proverbs chapter 30 and we'll find a great example of this. Back in the Old Testament, the middle of the Bible is Psalms. Right after that is Proverbs. Look at Proverbs chapter 30. While you're turning there, I'll talk about some of the other things in the Lord's Prayer. First of all, he says, give us this day our daily bread, asking God for something. That's definitely praying and saying, give me something. God, give me the food that I need to eat. But notice he's not saying, Lord, give me great feasts and give me enough food to where I can stockpile it for many years to come. The prayer is to give us this day our daily bread. And then next he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, what we can learn from that is, of course, the concept of praying and confessing our sin to God and asking for, you know, him to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, to forgive our sins, our trespasses. Now, of course, this has nothing to do with salvation. We're saved. We're eternally secure. It would be like if my son came to me and said, Dad, I messed up, I did wrong, and I'm sorry, would you forgive me, Dad? He's not saying, Dad, may I remain your son? Can I still remain in the family? No. What is he trying to do? He's just trying to mend the relationship there. And that's all it is when we confess sin to God and would say to God, you know, forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses, Lord. All we're saying is, like a child would say to their dad, Dad, I've done wrong and I'm sorry. And we're just confessing that, trying to make things right with God, not to try to remain saved. Some people literally think that they're saved by asking for forgiveness for their sins every day. Now, you're on thin ice if that's what you're doing, because first of all, we, don't, we have sins that we don't even know about. We commit sin without even realizing it. We sin every single day. And then people literally think 
that if they die between sinning and asking forgiveness, they're going to go to hell because they're not in a state of grace, you know, is the Catholic terminology for that. You know, and that it's nonsense, my friend. That's why they teach, hey, if you commit suicide, you're going to hell because, you know, you didn't have a chance to ask forgiveness, so you're not in a state of grace. And, and they, the people in the Middle Ages, if they wanted to commit suicide, then they were Catholic, they would tie a, a stone to themselves and throw themselves into the sea because then they could ask forgiveness and they could repent and, you know, they still couldn't untie the thing. You know what I'm saying? So they could, like, kill themselves. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, and repent and, and untie it. But they can't untie it because it's chained to them. And then they drown. So that was what they would do. You know, this is nonsense. Salvation is the gift of God by grace through faith not of works, lest any man should boast. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. We don't have to keep getting saved over and over again. Right. Jesus didn't say that to be saved, you had to be born again and again and again and again and again. He said you must be born again. One, just one time. Just like my children were born in my family one time, we must be born into God's family one time. He also said that we should pray not to be led into temptation. You know, that God would keep us out of the path of temptation. And also that we would be delivered from evil, that we'd be protected, that we would be safe. And he says uh, at the end, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Look down at Proverbs chapter 30. This is a, a prayer unto God. This is speaking unto the Lord. It says in verse 7, two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So that's similar to the prayer of give us this day our daily bread. Not looking for great riches and great stockpiles and great feasting and, and wealth, but just saying, look, just don't make me poor or rich. I just want to be fed and I want to be clothed and I want to just be able to live my life, you know, as a godly person and go to work and serve God and feed and raise and take care of my family. And that is what our goal should be as Christians. Our goal should not be to be rich. And some people today, even amongst Christians, they get excited about getting rich and they get this goal of, of putting away a whole bunch of money and getting very wealthy and they get caught up in all the financial seminars and the Dave Ramsey and the Michael Kiyosaki, Kosotu, Tokyo. I don't know. What's that guy's name? Robert Kiyosaki and the Donald Trump and everything. And you say, well, you know, Dave Ramsey's just telling you to get out of debt. You know, well, great, get out of debt. But then Dave Ramsey's also telling you to stockpile a bunch of money and get wealthy and lay up treasures on this earth. And that is not what the Bible teaches. And we should not obsess and fixate on money. Now, if your finances are screwed up, yeah, you need to give some attention to that. If you're in debt, if you owe people money, yeah, you do need to dwell on that and get that fixed. But it should not be a goal of just laying up great treasures. See, there's a difference, though, isn't there, between being in debt up to your eyeballs and stockpiling great treasures. You know, I want to find that middle ground. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, Lord. That's a prayer that we could pray to God, just saying, God, help me to feed my family and provide my needs. It's not carnal to pray for your physical needs. If you need stuff physically, pray for those things, and there's nothing carnal about it. God will give you those things, and he will help. You know, if you, if you need a job, pray for a job. You know, if you need uh, a vehicle to get to jo the job, you know, pray for that. Pray for your food. Pray for your clothes. Pray for all those things. But also, we should be praying for spiritual things. One of the greatest things that we could pray for is wisdom. Now, turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter number 4. And while you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, uh, let me read for you from James chapter 1, verse 5. It says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. This is something where if you pray to God for wisdom, you're guaranteed an answer to prayer. You know, you just keep asking God for wisdom and, and, and maybe in different areas of life, and God will give you wisdom. But the Bible says, but there's always the caveat. It's not just a carte blanche of prayer with God. He says, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So basically, if you pray to God and say, oh, God, give me wisdom, 
but then you're, you're also kind of looking into the wisdom of the world and you're not really sure whether what the Bible teaches is really the right way to live your life in a certain area. You know, God's not going to mess with you at that point. He's saying you have to ask in faith, trusting God to provide the wisdom and trusting God's word as the ultimate source of wisdom, not trying to say, well, I'm kind of mixing the wisdom of this world with the wisdom of God. Now, there are certain things that this world has to offer that there's nothing wrong with them if they have nothing to do with spiritual things. If it's just, you know, practical things of, you know, how to work on a car or something or how to build something. But when it comes to spiritual things, our spiritual wisdom needs to come from the Bible. And so we need to ask in faith and trust that God's word is true. And any time we are listening to something of this world that begins to contradict principles of the Bible, we must immediately reject it out of hand. If we want to be the kind of person that is nothing wavering, that has complete faith in God when we ask God for wisdom, that means when we hear the wisdom of this world, it says, well, here's an alternative how to, how to have your marriage or how to raise your kids or how to run your business, and it contradicts God's word, it should be rejected out of hand. Amen. And if we don't reject it out of hand, then God's not going to give us the real wisdom. There are things out there, that wisdom and teachings, that don't contradict God's word, that are just practical things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But any time anything begins to contradict God's word, it needs to just be immediately rejected as false, Amen. because God's word is truth. Amen. And it's the only thing that we can really trust and anchor our soul to. It's the rock of our salvation. Now, let's talk about the second kind of prayer. The first type of prayer is just basically just asking for things. And this is also known as supplication. And the meaning of the word supplication is when we humbly entreat for something, when we humbly uh, request something from God. So that would be asking for something, supplication. But secondly, there's another type of prayer, which is the prayer of thanksgiving. Look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. So here we see the component of asking for something and requesting something, but also we see that it's done with thanksgiving. And then the Bible says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, the reason we can have peace when we pray to God and make our requests unto Him is that we know that He hears us whatsoever we ask. So we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. That means if I need something in my life and I pray to the Lord and ask him to give it to me, then I can just rest assured and not worry about it. I can go to sleep at night and not be biting my fingernails and worried about it because I know that God is either going to give me what I've requested if it's his will or he has a reason why he's not going to give it to me that's for my own good or for the furtherance of the gospel. A lot of things that we ask for are we're asking amiss. You know, we're asking for the wrong stuff and God knows better. Wouldn't you rather God would withhold things from you that you ask for if you know that they were going to ruin your life or make you miserable or, or ruin other people's lives? You know, I, I remember my sister was telling me she had a prayer list where she would keep like a prayer journal or she would write down what she was praying for and then revisit it six months later, 12 months later. And she said when she would revisit it, everything on the list, because she would then mark them off if they were answered. A year later, she'd look at that list and say, you know, this was answered, this was answered, this was answered. And she said everything was either answered or she would look at it and say sometimes, you know, I don't even want that anymore. That's not even what I want anymore. Because at the time she wanted something, but then later she realized that that wasn't really the right thing. And so God really does answer our prayers. It's not that we're just going through an exercise. And so if you pray to God and say, oh God, help me with this and that situation, at that point, you can just relax because either he's going to help you with that situation or he's going to do something different that maybe you haven't even thought of, but you know that you're in his will at that point. But listen, if you don't pray, you don't have that assurance because if you don't pray, there's the thought that God could have stepped in and fixed it. God could have given you the things that you needed and maybe he's just not doing it because you're not asking. But when you're doing the things that are pleasing in his sight, keeping the commandments, praying to the Lord, you can have the peace of God that passeth all understanding to just know that, hey, whatever happens, whatever God gives me, 
it's what God has for me and I'm going to accept it from the Lord. And it's going to be for my best because the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. Flip back, if you would, to uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And while you're turning to Daniel, I'll give you a few other scriptures here on Thanksgiving. Colossians 4.2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Nehemiah 11.17 talks about thanksgiving in prayer. It says, And Mattathiah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, was the principal to begin the thanksgiving in prayer. And Bakbukiah, the second among his brethren, and Abda, the son of Shemua, the son of Galal, the son of Jeduthun. And then also, when you look at Jesus Christ, often it'll talk about him breaking bread and giving thanks and then eating. And also the Apostle Paul, where he would break bread and then he would give thanks and then they would eat. So this is where we get the custom of thanking God for our food before we eat because we see Jesus doing it. You see the Apostle Paul doing it in the Bible. And so we often pray before we eat. Now, this is a great custom as long as it doesn't become a vain repetition because sometimes I think people just mindlessly go through a ritual, but they're not really in their heart, you know, thankful to God. They're not only really thinking about what they're saying. Dear Jesus, thank you for this food. Bless our bodies. Jesus, name, amen. You know, just kind of crank through a prayer for the food, Right? just rattle something out instead of actually thinking about what we're saying. You know, like I, I heard about a kid that would pray every meal and say, you know, bless all the missionaries in the cornfield because he, he meant to say praying for the missionaries on the foreign fields, but he didn't really understand the meaning. He's just saying it, just chanting, repeating, you know, bless all the missionaries in the cornfields. You know, so we need to think about what we're saying and mean it from our heart and actually comprehend, you know, what it means to thank God for our food. Because just just saying it, just bowing our head and putting on a show doesn't really mean anything to God. It has, it's supposed to come from the heart and it shouldn't be a vain repetition. But, you know, prayer for our food would be to, first of all, thank God. That's what Jesus is predominantly doing. He's giving thanks for the food. So it would be to, first of all, say, thank you, God for providing the food. And you say, well, you know, I went out and bought this food. I worked for it myself. But then you're a fool if you don't give God the glory for the food that you eat because the Bible says it is he that giveth you the power to get wealth. God gives you your health and your strength. God has provided you with a job. God has provided you with places to buy inexpensive, healthy food. And often uh, we eat better food than your average person. In fact, in America today, many of us eat as kings would have eaten hundreds of years ago. Because if you think about it, hundreds of years ago, you didn't eat food from all over the world at all seasons. You know, you ate the local food. And if you wanted to eat exotic spices and things brought from India or China or other distant places and fresh fruits from other parts of the world, only a king would eat like that. But we have fruits and vegetables and spices flown in from all over the world, and we can pretty much eat whatever we want and honestly, there's a lot to be thankful for with that. We Amen. thank God just for the pleasure that we get to enjoy of, of eating such good food and just the health benefits of eating nutritious food. You know, hopefully you're eating nutritious food. Otherwise, you're going to really have to pray hard for that food. You know, <laughs> if you're going to if you're gonna go out and eat a bunch of junk food, you better be praying. Be like, oh, God, please let this food not kill me. You know, <laughs> please just change it, Lord. Make it organic. <laughs> Remove the pesticide, Lord, you know. You're the God that parted the Red Sea. You know, you can fix this, Lord. I know you can do it. You know. I don't, you know, I mean, if, if that's the only food that I had, and it was junk, that's how I'd be praying. Yeah. Now, when you go out and choose junk, you know, I don't know if God's necessarily going to change the molecular structure of that food. You know what I mean? But honestly, uh, we should be thankful for our food. Give thanks. And then where prayer or asking could come in, too, is, you know, to just pray that the food would strengthen us and be good for us and that there would be nothing harmful in that food. So the third type of prayer, we talked about just the basic supplication, asking for things, we talked about the prayer of thanksgiving. But a third type of prayer is a prayer of confession unto God. And I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with the Lord's Prayer. But look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, a prayer of confession to God, confessing our sins to God. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books 
the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We've sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgment. So this is a prayer of confessing sin to God and saying, God, we've sinned, we've blown it. At the end of the chapter, verse 21, it says, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Flip over to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. So this is interesting because in Daniel... At the beginning of the chapter, he begins to confess sin to God and to make supplication to God. And he's praying for wisdom, for knowledge, for skill, for understanding. He's praying for spiritual things. And this angel shows up unto him and says to him, he says, I'm now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. He says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I am come to show thee. You know, if you read Daniel 9 and 10, you read about Daniel praying, and at one point the answer comes 21 days later. But then the angel, when he comes and speaks to him, says, you know, from the first day that you started praying, God sent me to answer the prayer. But he talks about how he was held up, you know, a lot of spiritual battles going on and things. And so, therefore, it took 21 days for Daniel to get the answer. So sometimes our prayers are not going to be answered immediately. Sometimes it takes time, even if God decides right away, hey, I'm going to answer you right away. Sometimes it just takes time for the answer to get there, okay? Because God in his wisdom has a certain time frame in which he works. But he gives skill. Understand, these are the type of things that we would pray for if we're smart. Because in Proverbs over and over again, the Bible tells that wisdom is the principal thing and that we should seek knowledge and understanding. Remember King Solomon. He was told by God, hey, pray for anything you want. And what did he ask for? wisdom, an understanding heart, knowledge, and he was given those things. He was answered because he asked for that which was spiritual. One of the greatest things we can pray for is spiritual wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Uh, famous prayer in the Bible is in Psalms when the Bible says, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. That's a great thing to pray as you're opening the Bible, saying, God, please show me the truth, give me knowledge, give me understanding, give me skill and wisdom. You'd also ask for skill at your job, skills to, uh, to do what you need to do to serve the Lord in this life and to take care of your family. First John chapter 1 has more on this idea of confession. It says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This goes to show you that anyone who says that they have not sinned or anyone that says that they presently have no sin is unsaved. Because the Bible says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, the truth is not in us. And of course, the spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. He said, thy word is truth. How could that be abiding in you if you claim to be sinless? Right. Whenever anybody says that they are sinless, you know that the truth is not in them. Yep. And anybody says, I have not sinned, then you know that they are a lot, they're making God a liar. And his word is not in them. And you know what, you know what another name for the word is? Jesus. Yep. Jesus is not in them because it's the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Jesus is the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. So that right there shows us that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's going to go easier on the chastening, nothing to do with heaven and hell. God's going to go easier on the chastening if we confess our sins to him. And if we are sorry and make supplication 
and he's going to help us do better and help us grow and help us uh, get cleansed of that. Look at James, uh, or look at 1 John chapter 5. And I want to talk about a, a fourth type of prayer. So far we've talked about just basic supplication and requests unto God. Asking for something is the first type of prayer. Number two, there's a prayer of thanksgiving. We need to be thanking God in our prayers. Number three, there's confession. Prayer of confession where we're confessing sins to God. And, and you know, we should be specific and say, you know what, God, here's what I did, I'm sorry. And uh, God will hear that and he's faithful and just. His, his mercies are new every morning, the Bible says. But fourthly, there is intercessory prayer. Now, this is sort of like confession, but it's for someone else. Confession is for ourself, basically telling God we're sorry and pleading with God to be merciful unto us like Daniel did. But intercessory prayer is when we do that for someone else who is in sin. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 16, If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, what's another word for ask? Pray. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So if, if we see our brother sin, what does the Bible say that we're supposed to do? If we see a fellow Christian committing sin, one of the things that we're supposed to do is pray for that person. Now, why would we pray for that person? Now, most people would think, oh, I'm just going to pray that they'll stop sinning. But, but here's the thing, though. That's up to them. Yeah. Or they stop sinning. You know, God doesn't make people stop sinning. We have to stop sinning, okay? God can help us and guide us and bring circumstances into our lives. But one of the things that we could pray is basically that God would be merciful to that person. Sort of like when God was just going to start killing the Israelites and then Moses is praying, God, Please don't destroy them, Lord. You know, he's basically pleading with God to be merciful. If we love our brothers and sisters in Christ and we see them do something that we know is wrong, we know it's sin, our attitude should not be that we just want to see God really cloud up and rain on them. I hope God comes down hard on them. Make an example to everybody. No, because you know what? God already makes examples of plenty of people what we ought to do if we have love in our heart for our brothers and sisters in Christ is to pray for them and say, God, please be merciful unto them, Lord. Be, be gentle with them, Lord. Help them to get it right. If there's anything I can do to help, Lord. But no matter what, Lord, just please take it easy on them. Because you know what? God likes that because it shows that we love them. Because whatsoever things that we would, that men would do unto us, we're supposed to do unto them. And here's the thing. If I committed sin, I would want people praying for God to go easy on me yeah, right. and not to just come down on me like a ton of bricks. And so I'm going to pray that for my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's called making intercession. And this is what Jesus is doing up for us in heaven. The Bible says that he's making intercession for us daily. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Yeah. So he basically pleads with the Father to go easy on us as Christians for his sake and for the sake of his sacrifice on the cross to go easy on us as Christians. Look at James chapter 5. We'll see more intercessory prayer. James chapter 5, verse 13. The Bible reads, Is any sick among you? I'm sorry, is any... Start in verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. So he's saying, look, you're in a bad mood. Things are going bad. Pray. If you're in a good mood... Things are going great, sing psalms. He says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now, when the Bible says the Lord shall raise him up, it's talking about raising him up out of the sick bed, okay? Because this isn't just talking about somebody who has the sniffles. You know, this is talking about somebody who's very sick. And it says, as any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Notice they're coming to him. You know, he's real sick. And it says, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. This is not talking about, hey, it's going to get him to heaven. A lot of people misunderstand the Bible when they think save is always talking about heaven and hell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, when, what about when Peter's drowning and says, Lord, save me? He's not saying, you know, that he wants to have Jesus in his heart. He's saying, you know, get me out of the water. I'm drowning. Yeah, right. So here... 
when it says the prayer of faith shall save the sick, it's talking about the fact that he's not going to die of his illness. You know, people throughout history have gotten sick and died frequently, especially, you know, back when, when they had sometimes very strange medical practices, didn't have as good of sanitation, didn't eat good food. You know, when people were really, really sick and had a bad fever and everything, it, you know, you were really praying for that person that, that God would be merciful. And so we still should pray that way because even today there's a danger anytime people get very sick. And so it says, The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. Watch this. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Why? Because the Bible's clear that sometimes sickness is a result of our sin. Now, where this becomes a false doctrine is when we would say, anytime somebody's sick, oh, that's sin. They're in sin. That's a wicked thing to, to say. But this is what the prosperity preachers will sometimes teach. The name it, claim it, put your hand on the screen type people that tell you, hey, if you're right with God, you'll never be sick and everything's going to go great and you're going to be wealthy and everything like that. That's not really true because look at Job. Job was without sin. I mean, I'm not saying he was perfect, but he didn't have some big sin in his life, okay, where, where God was punishing him. Obviously, he was a human being. He made mistakes, but he had not sinned to bring that sickness and, and punishment upon himself. The Bible is very clear about that, very clear. But what did his three friends say? They told him, look, if you weren't living in sin, this wouldn't be happening to you when they looked at his sickness. But the Bible tells us that he was the most righteous man on the earth at that time. So why was he sick? For another reason. So we don't want to get carried away to where anytime somebody's sick, that's a punishment from God. God's chastening them. That's simply not true. Sometimes people just get sick for no reason. Or sometimes they're sick because God has a reason for allowing them to be sick because he wants some circumstance to take place that we don't understand. But here's the thing, though. A lot of people, they go to the other extreme where they would just say, well, well, God would never send sickness as a punishment. And that's foolish because all throughout the Bible, he talks about sending sickness as a punishment. In 1 Corinthians 11, even in the New Testament, he says, for this cause are many sick among you and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. The Bible talks about God sending sickness as a chastening. Now, it's not our job to judge other people. And to look at their sickness and be like Job's three friends and say, yep, he's getting punished for his sin. It's not our job to look at other people and make that judgment because we don't really know that that's why they're getting sick. So what the Bible says is that when someone is sick and we pray for them, we just pray for them with an if. Because he says, if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So just because somebody's sick, it doesn't mean that they sinned. But if they have committed sins, we can make intercession and pray and say, Dear Lord, I pray that, you know, brother so-and-so would, would be made well again, that he would recover from this illness. And I remember recently, you know, I knew somebody who had a very severe life-threatening illness. And I was praying, and, I, and, I, and one of the things I prayed was I said, God, you know, if, if this is a result, if this is a result of some sin in his life, Lord, I just pray that you would just forgive him and just be merciful and just give him another chance and just, just heal his body anyway, Lord, and be kind unto him. Be gracious unto him, Lord, because of your mercy, you know? And so that's what it means to pray intercessory prayer. And I think a lot of people miss this in the Bible and they miss it as a part of their prayer life. I think most of us ask for stuff. You know, most of us say thank you to God when things go good and we thank uh, God for our food. I think pretty much anybody who's a Christian does a lot of confessing to God yeah. because we sin a lot and we confess to God a lot as Christians, right? But I think intercessory prayer sometimes goes by the wayside where, where we will pray for other people sometimes, but it's not in an intercessory way. You know, we might pray for other people just for needs that they have, but we should also pray for God to be gracious to their sins and to be merciful to their transgressions. That's part of what we should be praying. So that's the fourth type of prayer. Now, fifth type of prayer is what we would call imprecatory prayer, okay? Now, this is something that a lot of people reject, but, you know, it's biblical. People can reject it all they want, but it is biblical. Go to Psalm 69. In fact, there are 19 psalms that are classified as the imprecatory psalms. Now, psalms is a book of prayers and praises unto God. 
And 19 of the Psalms are imprecatory Psalms. And to imprecate someone is just a fancy way of saying to curse someone. Amen. Imprecations are curses. Now, this is not popular because we live in la la sunshine happy land where everything has to be positive and sweetness and light and hear no evil, see no evil, and don't you dare say or preach or do or think or feel anything negative or we will have a drug for that, you know, to make you be happy and positive all the time. No, the Bible is a negative book. Yeah. It's both negative and positive. It's sort of like the battery that's under the hood of your car is both negative and positive. You know, and if you really want to be so positive, why don't you remove that negative terminal of your car? Because I think it's bringing you down. I think that that car is way too negative. You need to disconnect that negative terminal. All we need is a positive terminal. You know, I was talking to a Buddhist out soul winning on Wednesday and she was trying to tell me how much better Buddhism is than any other religion. And, you know, oh, Buddhism is such a wonderful religion because we've never started any wars and we've never hurt any. We wouldn't even hurt an earthworm. We practice nonviolence. Won't hurt anyone. Won't hurt anything. Nonviolence. It's so great. But here's what's so stupid about that. We never started any war. Okay, but let's see. The most sickest, bloodiest most wicked government regime in the history of mankind in communist China took place in a Buddhist country and the Dalai Lama supported Mao Zedong. Look it up. The Dalai Lama was sucked in by Mao Zedong and thought he was great. And yet he's supposedly a man of God with all this wisdom and revelation. You're so stupid, Dalai Lama, that you fell for Mao Zedong and thought he was a great guy the evil, bloodthirsty dictator that he was. And where did that all take place? In a place filled with Buddhists, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. You're, oh, nonviolence. Oh, but here's the thing. There is a time to kill. There is a time yeah. to love. There's a time to hate. I mean, to sit there and say, oh, just nonviolence. I won't kill anything. So basically, let's just let our house be filled with scorpions. I mean, we had 60 scorpions in our house. It was a time to kill. Okay, because we had a scorpion problem for years. For, for, year, for, for the first five years we lived here, we never saw a scorpion. And then we started seeing scorpions and scorpions, and we tried everything to get rid of them. We tried all the nonviolent methods, and, you know, we just couldn't get rid of them. So then finally, finally, I, 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 I did a bunch of research, and I figured out there's only one way to get rid of scorpions. You can't use pest control, but even, even, you know, even the ways that you'd normally think of killing bugs with pesticide and everything, it doesn't work. There's one way, you have to kill them, physically smash them, each and every one of them. So I went out with a black light and one of those paint stir sticks from Home Depot. That was my weapon of choice. And I went out with a black light and a paint stir stick and I went hunting for hours. You know, you gotta do it after dark because they glow in the black light. So I went out and hunted everywhere and I killed over 40, it was like 41, 42, I don't remember the exact number, it was a little over 40 scorpions in one night all around my house, front yard, and I don't have a big property at all, just a little tract home, but you know, they were just a lot of scorpions, and I went around and hunted them, and I killed them, and I smashed them, and chopped them up, you know, I tried to do it as humanely as possible, you know, finish them off fast, but you know, I killed like 40 some scorpions, and then one of them, I couldn't quite get to it, because it was inside this, this chicken wire, and I couldn't get it out, so I lit, I lit a fire, and I burned it out, okay? And I, I, actually, I actually killed two by fire. So, I mean, I put them to fire and sword, you know? And, and honestly, you know, it was a Buddhist nightmare, you know? I mean, I set myself back several reincarnations, according to these people, okay? But here's what's so stupid about that. I mean, there are people, I've heard about Buddhists, where their house is filled with mosquitoes, and they can't kill the mosquitoes. They can't even kill the mosquitoes. No, nonviolence. You know, they, they do all this stupid stuff. But here's the thing, though. If everybody, you know, that, oh, these Buddhists are just, oh, you know, we're all going to be nonviolent. But guess what? There's always going to be violent people. So who's going to fight back against the, the, the bad people? Oh, nonviolence. Yeah, but what happens when somebody's just coming in and assaulting your family? You're just going to stand back and just, nonviolence. What are you going to do? Just let your, your family be raped and killed? Of course not. So this whole thing of just, just this, this taking it to this extreme of just non-violent. No, the Bible says kill and eat about animals. 
And the Bible also teaches that we should defend ourselves and our family and not just uh, practice this thing of just, you know, never harm anyone for any reason. But this mentality has gotten into our American society now where we're not Christian anymore. We're getting influenced by all these other philosophies and these Eastern philosophies. And now, for example, if you hear the word hate, it's just like, oh, hate. Oh, that's so bad. Oh, hate is so evil. When in reality, everybody hates someone or something. Yeah. They just don't admit it. And hate has become this cuss word, this four-letter word. Of don't hate. Oh, don't you dare hate. You're so hateful. And really, anything that you say that's negative just becomes hateful. Yeah. Oh, you hate because you'll preach against sin. And so the churches now, the Christian Bible-believing churches now, you know it, my friend, have gotten to where they're like 90% positive, 10% negative. Yeah. If you're lucky. It's not 100% positive, Joel Osteen style. But what is the Bible like? The Bible is both negative and positive. And listen, there is more negative in this book than there is positive. It's a fact. And, and if you don't think so, well, you haven't been reading it. There are more negative things in this book than positive. No, there's both. And some people make the mistake of just going overboard where it's just negative, negative, negative. And then other people just go where it's positive, positive, positive. We need to preach the whole thing. So we can't just reject a whole section of the Bible and say, oh, well, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that it's right to ever curse anyone or anything for any reason. No imprecatory prayer. I'm only going to love, 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 love. And all you need is love. But that's not biblical, friend. And, and I don't buy into that philosophy. I think that there is a place for negativity, my friend. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a very positive person in my personal life. You can ask my wife and kids. I'm, I'm you know, he says, if you're afflicted, pray. If you're merry, sing songs. You know, I'm merry most of the time. I mean, I do a lot of psalm singing, you know, more than praying because of the fact that I'm a very merry, happy, positive person. But you know what, though? It's wrong to just be only positive all the time. And it's wrong to be only negative all the time. There is a time and a place for both. And we do need to have some negativity in our lives. And this, this attitude that, oh, get rid of anything negative. It's a lie of the devil. Yeah. Because, of course, the devil wants to teach you don't fight. Don't fight. Don't get mad. Don't put up any resistance. Don't harm anything or anyone for any reason. Because then he can just walk all over you roughshod and take over. Because you're not fighting anything or attacking anything. Or, you know, when I preach sermons, I, sometimes I preach an attack sermon. Why? Because there are some things that need to be attacked today. Amen. Fight the good fight. But of course the devil wants to convince us to just be passive. Why? So he can walk all over us. You know, and why does the Bible liken unto a sword? Why didn't he liken it unto a plowshare? Or why didn't he liken it unto a pruning hook? Why did he say it's a sword? Because it's a weapon. And again, I'm not preaching violence or, hey, let's go out and, 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 and kill and put everything to fire and sword. I will put the scorpions to fire and sword. But honestly, it's a spiritual warfare. It's not a physical battle that we're fighting. I'm not going out to harm physical people. I've never, you know, harmed a person. I've never laid hands on somebody and, and, and assaulted them and injured them or anything like that. And I'm not going to. I don't plan on it. You know, if I had to, God forbid, protect myself or my family or someone else, you know, I would do it. I wouldn't shrink from it, but I've never had to. And I hope I never do. But you know what? This sword is going to be engaged in the battle. And there's going to be bloodshed spiritually. And it is a spiritual warfare. So don't get all nervous about the imprecatory psalms. Don't get all scared about imprecatory prayer and get all uncomfortable. Like, oh, I don't know, man. You know, this is weird. You know, this is... Look, just get over the brainwashing for a minute that tells you that anything that's negative is bad. And just look at the Word of God and say, well, this is what God is saying. Let's just read it and see what it says. Look at some of the prayers that David prayed. And keep in mind, a lot of people will write these off and say... Oh, that's just David. But the Bible, whenever it quotes Psalms in the New Testament, it will often say things like, the Holy Ghost spake by the mouth of David, the prophet. Yeah. And so we have to understand that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. And by the way, even some of these imprecatory Psalms were quoted by Jesus and were quoted in the New Testament. We'll see that in a moment. 
But look at an example of an imprecatory prayer. Look at verse 22 of Psalm 69. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Now, is this intercession? Is this saying, God, go easy on them. God, be gentle with them. No, it's the exact opposite. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity. It's the exact opposite of, of making intercession for our brothers in Christ. Because this is not directed toward our brothers in Christ. It says, let them not come into thy righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. Flip over to Psalm 109. But see, a lot of people, you'll read this to them and then they'll just say, I still don't believe in it. Wow. It's like, well, what in the world? And then, or they'll say like, well, but what about the New Testament? Yeah, but these are quoted in the New Testament. And I'm going to show you some imprecations in the New Testament. But not only that, but the Bible in the New Testament says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all knowledge, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We are commanded to sing the psalms. There are 150 psalms. And so why does God want us to sing these if they're just totally irrelevant and not applicable in the New Testament? No, they're, they're, they're pointed to in the New Testament. It says in Psalm 109, verse 6, Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned. Now let me stop right there. This isn't in my notes, but that prayer right there, let Satan stand at his right hand, that imprecatory prayer, because that's not a blessing to have Satan at your right hand. That's a curse. Right. Yeah. That imprecatory prayer is commanded in 1 Corinthians 5, which is one of the, you know, these dispensationalists, right? It'll tell you, oh, it's just what Paul wrote. Okay, well, let's go to what Paul wrote. In 1 Corinthians 5, it says that the man who was committing fornication with his father's wife, that they were supposed to get together and pray and to deliver such an one unto Satan. And then not only that, Paul talked about praying an imprecatory prayer toward false teachers. He said, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander? He said, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So what did the Apostle Paul mean when he named a few false prophets and he said, I've delivered them unto Satan? And when he said about this guy who's just committing this gross sin in the presence of the whole congregation, everybody knows about it, and he said, D deliver such an one unto Satan. Well, what's it say here? You know, let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned. Look at the end of verse 7. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him. I mean, look, we could go on and on. I mean, it goes on till like verse 20. And then we could go to other places like Psalm 55, 15, where it says, Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. You know, we could go on and on. But some people just reject Scripture. They'll just reject Scripture and then demonize somebody who preaches these Scriptures and say that they're bad for preaching God's Word. Now, if you would, let's just look at a little bit of an example of this in... Uh, you know, for example, you go to Galatians uh, chapter 1 if you want. Flip over to Galatians 1. But while you're turning to Galatians 1, let me show you some imprecatory prayer in the New Testament. Uh, for example, 2 Timothy 4.14, Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. He said in Galatians 5.12, he said, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. He said in Galatians 1, 8, and 9, But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. And of course, there are also quotations in the New Testament of the Psalms that we read. Uh, Romans eleven nine. you know, David saith, 
Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. You know, that's Romans 11 verse 10. So what's going on with these imprecatory prayers? Well, this is not just, hey, somebody does us wrong. We're going to pray down the wrath of God on them. <laughs> that's not what this teaching because the Bible tells us to love our enemies, right? He said, love your enemies. But a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that that's some new teaching to the New Testament, when in reality, the Old Testament teaches to love your enemies, okay? What are these imprecatory psalms? Look, he says, love your enemies, pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you, you know, bless them that curse you, all these different things. You say, well, you know, it's a contradiction. Look, whenever you run into something in the Bible that seems like a contradiction, you have to have the faith to believe that the whole Bible is true, right? Isn't that the starting point of saying, hey, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The wrong way of handling it when you come to an apparent contradiction where you got scriptures over here saying bless and curse not. You know, don't return cursing for blessing. Bless your enemies, love your enemies, pray for your enemies. And then over here you've got curses being placed on people and, and, and a man of God cursing people and even the word of God showing us examples to curse people, okay? and even a command to curse people who preach a false gospel. Well, when we look at those two things, a lot of people will just make the mistake of just picking the one that they like. Pick one I like and just reject the other one. Now, does that make any sense at all to just pick one, throw out the other? No, what we have to realize is that, wait a minute, both of these, both of these have to be true because they're both in God's word. So how can we interpret this to where they're both true? Because if we interpret it in such a way where there's a, a contradiction, it's not that there's a problem with the Bible. It's that the problem is with our interpretation. Yeah. So what we have to do is figure out, okay, what am I interpreting wrong here? Why this is not making sense to me? And then we have to find a way to interpret it to where they're both true. Now, if you interpret the Bible as, hey, we should never pray anything negative to anyone. It's wrong to ever pray for anyone to die or to be punished or to be afflicted. That's always wrong. Then now you're contradicting 19 Psalms. Out of 150, you've contradicted 19 of them. And you've contradicted Jesus and the Apostle Paul and all kinds of scripture. But what if you interpreted it this way? What if you interpreted it as, God wants me when somebody smites me on my right cheek, to turn to him the other also. And when people do me wrong, I'm supposed to patiently bear it. And when people curse me, I'm supposed to bless them. And I'm supposed to love my enemies, but that I'm supposed to basically hate those who are wicked, evil, reprobate, depraved, sick people. Now, isn't there a difference between being your personal enemy and being a son of Belial, wicked, reprobate, evil child? You know, it's totally different. And that's what the Bible actually teaches. You know, D David said, you know, I hate those that hate the Lord. And the Bible tells us in, in 2 Chronicles 19, verse 2, that we should hate those, or, we, or we, should, we should hate those who hate the Lord. Don't love those who hate the Lord. Okay. So, for example, somebody cuts me off in traffic, I'm supposed to bless that person. Somebody at work lies about me in order to get the promotion that I should have got, I'm supposed to love and bless that person and forgive them. Amen. Somebody slaps me in the face or shoves me out soul winning, I'm supposed to forgive them, love them, and pray for them to be saved, right? Amen. But there are people in this world that are, just, I mean, think about, what about some serial killer, serial rapist, child molesters? I mean, would it be wrong to just pray for them to just die and go to hell yeah. before they hurt anybody else? No. Whoa, wrong answer, buddy. <laughs> no, because look, and that's what we see here. You know, we see them praying. We see David praying for just wicked, horrible, reprobate people. I mean, think about it. what if you what if you were living in communist China while Mao Zedong was in power? Would it be wrong for you to pray for him to die or for them to be defeated when they go to war? Wouldn't you pray for the Red Army to be defeated? and pray for them to be, to be killed because you want to have, you know, righteousness and godliness again. It's, and, and look, it's not that he's your personal enemy or anything. It's just that they're ungodly, wicked, horrible people. You know, and, and for example, you know, this week, this, this filthy sodomite picture is everywhere and people are showing this transvestite or transgender or whatever this guy is. You know what I'm talking about? 
this, this athlete or whoever he is. I don't know who it is. I'd never even heard of him before this week. Bruce Jenner has basically mutilated his body, apparently. And, and, and you know what? He's being praised by our president. Our President Obama is praising him for, or, or praising her. We don't even know what it is. I think that he used the female pronoun about somebody named Bruce and said, you know, oh, oh, such courage. You're so wonderful. Oh, oh, you know, our, our president is praising the wicked here, okay? And, and there's just all the, and I mean, this, this filthy pervert is just like on all these magazine covers and just everywhere, just being crammed on our throat to literally, like hundreds of millions of people, literally hundreds of millions of people are being subjected to looking at a trans freak. Yeah. 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 And this person is just the, the evangelist of sodomy and filth to the world. And you know what? And, people are, and, then, and then people are like, oh, we need to pray for him that he finds Jesus. I'm going to pray that he dies and goes to hell. Right. Are you serious? Right. Look, I have nothing but hate. When I see a man dressed up as a woman who has mutilated his body to become a woman and saying, hey, look at me, everybody. Look at me, kids. I mean, the kids in America today, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old are seeing this freak. And having their minds perverted and ruined permanently, I hope, I, listen to me, I hate him with a perfect hatred. Amen. I have no love, no love for this Bruce freak. I hope he dies today. I hope he dies and goes to hell. He's disgusting. He's filthy. He's reprobate. And I would pray all these prayers from Psalm 69. And so, oh, how could you say that? Well, how did God say it? I pray all this in Psalm 69 and Psalm 109 toward him. Amen. You evil, filthy animal that's destroying the morals of our country, right. die! Amen. Oh, you're hateful. No, I'm loving. I love my children. Yeah. I love my country. Amen. I love the brotherhood. And I hate these filthy sons of Belial. Yeah. It's, they're disgusting and sick. Yeah. Oh, pray for him. Oh, we need to love him and pray for him, help him find Jesus. That guy will never find Jesus. Yeah. The Bible says he's reprobate. Amen. The Bible explains why people would, would, would lust after other men when they're a man. Because they're reprobate. Because yep. yeah. they've been darkened. And you say, well, I'm offended. I don't want to ever... Then get out of here. Amen. Because you know what? You're not welcome here. Yeah. Honestly, nobody who defends that freak is welcome in this church. Amen. Why? Because look around. Look at all the little children. It's not safe right. to have perverts like you in our church Amen. if you're going to defend that filth. Yeah. Yeah. Get out. You don't belong here. You afraid you're going to lose people? I hope I lose people with this kind of preaching. I hope I lose all the freak, pervert sympathizers. Get out of here. You're destroying America. Amen. I'm going to stand up for what's right. Yeah. I'm going to pray the imprecatory prayers. Amen. Let's go to the last type of prayer. The sixth prayer. You don't have love. You know, I love Christians. I love unsaved people. As long as they're not reprobates, as long as they're not evangelists of sodomy, as long as they're not preachers of damnation and lies and filth. Of course I love unsaved people. Of course I love the lost. But no, I don't love that kind of filth and perversion. They should be stoned with stones. That's what the Bible says. Okay? And all scripture is given by inspiration of God, not just the part that you like. But the last time, I'm out of time. I got a little carried away on that part. But somebody needs to get carried away on that part. Amen. Where else are you going to hear it? So many kowtowing preachers today are probably whining and moaning and, oh, you know, it's getting hard in these last days, you know, with all this stuff. But, you know, you just got just to stay faithful and just remember God can still, God can still touch his heart. I hope God touches Bruce Jenner's heart like this. Just go, mm. That's how I want him to touch his heart. I hope, he, I pray that his heart would explode right now. Amen. Filthy, disgusting, repro I mean, look, are we living in the twilight zone? Is this a weird dream that I'm going to wake up from or something? That this is what our country is like? I mean, look, who would have thought? Who would have thought back in the 90s that we'd even be having this conversation? Who would have imagined 
I mean, who would have imagined that this is what America would be promoting and that our president would be praising people who cut off their privy member, as the Bible says. I mean, who in the world would have dreamed it possible? But yet today, people think I'm crazy. Yup, you're right, I'm crazy because I think that every man should keep his privy member in place. I'm nuts, I'm crazy. You know, go, then you go, go, go find the pastor that's not crazy then. Because you know what, I'll help you find it. Here's how you find a church that won't preach this way. Open the yellow pages, close your eyes, and drop your finger on the page. And go to that church, and you'll hear the sweetness and light you're looking for. You know that that's true. Amen. Yep. And, you know, thank God, I'm not the only one. There's still 7,000 men that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Amen. It's just TV that wants you to think that it's only a few people that believe this way. And, by the way, I was just out soul winning a week ago. And I knocked two doors in a row of just people in, an, in just a random soul winning day, or knocked two doors in a row, and both people said, I saw you on TV talking about the homos, and they said, I'm with you. Amen. I agree with you. Amen. Two doors in a row. So it's not everybody that believes in this junk. It's just that's what the world wants you to think. But anyway, the last type of prayer, yeah, I'm out of time. So I'll just touch on it real quickly. Just Romans 10 is the only place. The last type of prayer is, is the sinner's prayer, okay? So what did we talk about? We talked about supplication in prayer, making requests unto God. That's number one. When we need stuff, we pray to God when we need things, right? Secondly, there's a prayer of thanksgiving where we're thanking God for what he's already given us, right? Then thirdly, there's a prayer of confession where we confess our sins unto God. Fourthly, there's intercessory prayer where we confess the sins of other people. And by the way, you shouldn't, you shouldn't do this kind of prayer in a group. Right. You know what I mean? Like some people say, hey, listen, we really need to pray for so-and-so because he's living in sin right now. You know, did you, did you see what he did? You know, this is something that needs to be done privately. We don't get together in a group and we're going to pray because that's what some people will gossip about other people. And then it's all under the guise of, hey, we're going to pray for him because he was busted doing whatever. Okay. So, you know, intercessory prayer, that's when we confess not our own sins, but confess the sins of others and ask God to be merciful. Then there's imprecatory prayer, which is the opposite of intercessory prayer, where instead of praying, God, please bless your people, be good to them, overlook their sins, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's intercessory prayer, right? Forgive them, they know not what they do. Then there's the imprecatory prayer, which is reserved for just only the sickest, most violent, wicked, filthy, disgusting filthy sinners. And don't say that's everybody because it's not. Hang that out to dry. It's a lie, okay? The devil wants to convince you that all sins equal and blah, blah, blah. That's junk that's not found in the Bible. But anyway, you know, it's reserved for the, the, the Bruce Jenners and Barack Obamas of this world, you know, yeah. yep. and the Mao Say tongues. But anyway, the last one would be the sinner's prayer. This is when somebody prays and asks God for salvation. And this is a one-time thing. And this is, this is the most important prayer that anybody ever prays. And it only is prayed one time because it's the prayer that gets you saved. This goes all the way back to Genesis 4:26, when it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And in Romans chapter 10, we, we could also turn to other places where this is found. But in Romans 10, it says in verse 8, But what saith that the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart? That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is salvation. It's a one-time prayer where you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and just ask him for that free gift of salvation. So what's the sermon about? Prayer. If you are one that has become slack in praying, and I know that all of us can sometimes get slack in praying. We get busy and we don't think about praying. If we've been slack, let's stop and think about how we can increase our prayer life and we can start with these, you know, these five areas because the sixth area, hopefully you already took care of that one time. I took care of it when I was six years old when I prayed that sinner's prayer. 
But you can think about these five areas where you say, well, you know, what do I pray for? Pray for your needs. Pray for your physical needs. Thank God for what you already have. Confess your sins to God. Pray for people that you know that are maybe backslidden or maybe getting out of church or going into sin. Pray for God to be nice to them and to bless them. And pray for Bruce Jenner to die and go to hell. Amen. There's something to pray for. So you got five nice things to pray for. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your grace, Lord, and, and, and for the fact that we can come boldly to your throne, Lord. It's such a privilege, Lord, and there's so many things that I know I've missed out on, I'm sure, and other people have missed out on just because we didn't pray, Lord. But help all of us to pray. Help us not to miss out on the blessings that you have in store for us. Let it never be said of us that we have not because we ask not, Lord. Help us to pray every single day and to, not, and to put our heart into it and really mean it, Lord, when we pray. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.